Okay, uh, it's good to be with you this morning uh, talking about innovation at the edge of chaos. Um, I do actually have a master's in chaos and complexity theory, but I'm not going to go into great detail about chaos and complexity theory this morning. It's a bit more of a metaphor about what I want to cover. So first off, I need someone who's a bit of an extrovert who can help me with an illustration involving a glass of water. You won't get hurt, you won't really get embarrassed, um, but I just need a volunteer. Thank you. Thank you very much. What's your name? Oakley. Oakley. Thank you for volunteering. Now, this glass of water, which I'm about to pour, I'll just put it there. Now, if I was to give my presentation and leave that glass of water there, probably wouldn't be a lot of interest in the glass of water. But I'm going to get Oakley to do something. Oakley, I just want you to put that glass a little bit closer to the edge of the table. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Oakley, can you push it any further? <laughs> Good. Thank you very much. That's all you have to do, oh. Oakley. Well done. <laughs> Now that glass of water, if you could see it from the angle I can see it without that sort of frilly edge around the table, it's about, um, it's not quite halfway over the edge of the table, but it's getting close. So the next person to come and bump the table, that glass of water will end up, we're getting a photographic <laughs> record of it now, <laughs> it will end up over the edge. And there's not too much in front of it to cause harm, but if there was, um, that could be a bit more alarming. The illustration is that there's a space, when the glass is placed in the middle of the table, sitting right in the middle, it's in a complete state of order. It's going to stay there. Yes, there'll be a little bit of evaporation occurring, but essentially the glass is going to stay there for the duration of the session. If, however, the glass gets pushed closer across to the edge, it starts to get more interesting. We start to focus on it. And the reason why is that it's starting to open itself up to possibilities. As it gets closer to the edge, when Oakley was pushing that closer to the edge, you, you became much more interested. And she did actually push it a little bit too far, a little bit of water spilt out. She brought it back again. Had she not had such quick reflux, reflexes, it would have gone over the edge, water would have spilt, and it would have been in a different place. Um, there's a picture I found um, at johnart.com. That John is not me, or John Sheridan, I don't think either. But if you look at the left-hand side of that slide. I thought it was a pretty good um, picture for a few reasons. But on the left hand side we see complete order, chessboard like order, black and white squares in complete predictability. As we move across we see progressive interruption of that order, different states occurring as we move through. We get to the middle of the picture and um, you're starting to see a bit of disruption occurring. And then as we get over onto the right hand side, we're seeing a high degree of randomness. Now, when I showed that to one of my colleagues at work, they said you could have made it more random, but I don't think she realized I didn't come up with the, um, the bit of artwork myself. Um, so over on the right hand side, the reason I like it is that it starts to look like a whole series of post-it notes, which we all know post-it notes and creativity just go together. <laughs> um, so 
The illustration, I think, shows that around that middle, we're starting to get some disruption. We're starting to get a bit of interest. The middle of the page is a little bit like the middle of the glass of water over there. So the left-hand side is very much like the glass of water in the middle of the table. The right-hand side is very much like if the glass of water went over the edge, the water goes everywhere. So it's a good, uh, simple illustration we start to get more opportunity, more variety, more opportunities for change when we get round the middle of the sheet and new ideas can form. Now, the word chaos on the right-hand side comes from a Greek word. In fact, I think my next slide's a few definitions. I'll start down the bottom. The word chaos is a Greek word for disorder. And it's a lack of organisation leading to randomness and unpredictability. And it probably comes to one of the last questions that we had about that sort of change fatigue and John's response was about churn fatigue. When you're in that chaotic space, it's not necessarily a highly productive space because there's just so much happening, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen next. The word order... The Greek word is cosmos, so cosmos and chaos were the two terms in, in Greek. Order um, is an arrangement of things in a particular sequence, pattern or method leading to predictability. Order equally is not very helpful for innovation. Things are so stable, we're so bogged down by procedure, process, um, just complete rigidity that innovation can't occur in that space either. But if you get between order and chaos, you get to this space of innovation. Um, I'm in the process of writing a book at the moment, not on my own, but with some people from uh, some different universities around the world, Stanford and Harvard and uh, Milano Polytechnica and a few universities, and we're writing a book about innovation leadership. The reason we're writing that book is that a whole lot of universities across China and the US and Europe are struggling to produce some sort of um, curriculum, I think, around innovation. So they're struggling to teach it. And if you go and learn about innovation in Stanford, it'll be very different from if you go and learn about innovation in Harvard. Um, and they're struggling to come up with just some basics, some basic definitions to produce tomorrow's leaders in this space. And so I actually borrowed this definition that we, um, that we worked on, which is innovation, again, I'll, I'll go back to John's talk, it's not just the new idea in the shower, it's the new perspective that leads to a transformational idea that's coupled with some flawless execution and at the end of the day it delivers some value. So innovation and new idea are not synonyms. A new idea is in innovation but they're not synonyms. It has a range of elements and this definition may be wrong but it's what we've come up with a now sort of working definition. Uh, it's the new, pe new perspective plus the transformational idea plus the flawless execution that delivers value, that's the innovation. So the delivering value, there's this benefit here and the question about the, um, the kiosk that didn't work, well that website didn't deliver value. It delivered a broken website and an inability to report a traffic accident and possibly when you've just had a um, fairly traumatic traffic accident, the thing you don't want is to go and be pointed at a kiosk in a police station. So that value point is critically important. Value to the customer, uh, value to other stakeholders, whoever might have an interest in that. So there's some uh, just some working definitions and I'll be drilling into that innovation definition a little bit uh, as we go through. So the first part of that innovation uh, piece was about new perspectives. Um, 
Now, if this computer happens to be connected to the internet, I'm about to play you a one-minute clip of Steve Jobs talking about customer experience. Um, so hopefully it's all going to work. If it doesn't, I'll tell you what he's about to say. This is a really bad quality. I suspect it was originally filmed on an iPhone or something. But what year was it? <laughs> I don't even know if it was, um, I don't know the year, but here we go. Let's see if it works. This video is unavailable. <laughs> Probably because we're on, oh no, it's because Adobe's not on this machine. I'm going to tell you what he, it's going to be risky if I close all tabs. We might just try and get back to my presentation this way. Here we go. Um, I'll paraphrase, fortunately it's only a minute of clip. I was well uh, prepared for the fact that this may not work. Steve Jobs was actually asked a question. This was out of a longer um, video clip, about five minutes long. And he was asked a question by an audience. Uh, the question was a little bit insulting to Steve Jobs. It was something like, Steve, you don't know anything about some technology. Let's just say it was... Adobe Flash, because I just had a problem with it. Um, you don't know anything about Adobe Flash. You don't seem to know a lot about technology. You know, you're running this big company called Apple. It's a technology company, and you don't really know what you're talking about. That was the essence of the question. And uh, so, Steve, I thought this would be interesting. How's he going to respond? <laughs> How's he going to respond to this? And he was silent for a while and thought for a while. And he said to the fellow, you know, in many respects, you're absolutely right. I don't know anything about technology. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people out there that know a lot more about technology than I know. Um, but he said he'd learnt through, sort of, through trial and error, through lots of different experiences, through lots of um, situations in his life, that at the end of the day, what was important absolutely critically important, um, was really understanding the customer experience, really designing the customer experience, and building innovation from that. And Steve Jobs uh, was clearly well attuned uh, to be able to, to really imagine, get inside that. Now, you know, the guy was a genius, so we can't all copy Steve Jobs. But the central thrust, I think, that he was getting to in that clip is just, it doesn't matter if you understand JavaScript or if you understand Adobe Flash or if you understand how this bit of HTML connects to that bit. Um, it's really designing from the customer experience out and getting those new perspectives on things from immersing yourself in that customer experience and understanding it. So that little scenario we had there about the traffic accident is an example where you could think, well, yeah, the website's good, the website's up, we've got it available from kiosks, you know, we've got this multi-channel access to our website, but the customer experience was very poor and really wasn't well designed at the end because it had been designed from a whole lot of threads to that point, but not from really understanding that experience. So new perspectives often come from, from understanding the customers. Now I often get asked, we run a design, I run a design company called Think Place. Um, we've got offices in Wellington in New Zealand and Singapore in Australia and we have two people permanently in Kenya. Very different sets uh, of customers and I, I run, people often ask me, customers don't know what they want, so how, you know, this is a pointless sort of point that you're making here because customers don't know what they want, which is absolutely right. Customers don't always know what they want. The car you're driving today, 10 years ago, you could not have specified the things that are in it that you wanted. But there are things by understanding the customer experience, like seeing people, see a few of you in the audience will remember a map product called a Gregory's. <laughs> a few. 
Um, the Gregory's was actually the result of probably more divorces than any other device um, ever invented because you know you sort of some people like to hold it upside down, uh, some people just had very great difficulty translating spatially where they were on the planet in relation to this book. Um, but so we didn't necessarily say we want satellite navigation. But somebody experiencing, understanding that experience of being lost, you know, trying to find, going to a new city for the first time and trying to find your way, um, that was translated. And so the need was un the need can be observed. The solution requires innovation. That's where it, it does require new ideas and innovation. Similarly, with uh, you know other technologies in a car, like anti-lock brakes, for example. You know, you didn't know you wanted anti-lock brakes. You didn't know you wanted different brakes, different wheels braked at different proportion. But you did know you didn't want to have two wheels in gravel and two wheels on the bitumen and skidding off into a tree or an oncoming car. So we do know, you know, those needs are there. So the need for safety, the need for comfort, the need for um, solving some of these challenges is there. Um, but we can't get from asking the customer, how do you solve that need? So that's quite a central point. New perspectives also come from constraints. Often when, um, well, before budgets got tight, I would go into organisations and they say, well, I mean, this, sorry, this was even before budgets got as tight as they are today. I would go into organisations and they would say, well, we can't innovate because we don't have any money. And I would always find that a very interesting point because I always thought not having money is what caused you to innovate. Um, but there's a sense that, well, you do innovation when everything else is perfect and you've got time and it's not raining and it's sunny outside and you can swan down to the cafe and then I'll innovate. <laughs> um, it's sort of not like that. And so um, why innovators love constraints? This is an HBR article which you can look up. Um, Abby's sending all these slides, I think, around afterwards. And I've put um, all the references down the bottom so you'll be able to find them. But these are some of the headlines in that article. Fewer resources produce proximity. Proximity drives innovation. So fewer resources, and I'm seeing this a lot with our clients in, in government here in Canberra. Um, I think I got introduced to the term whole of government in about 1990 or 1991. Might have been around before then, but I heard of it first. When I first heard of it, it was then. Um, I'm really only seeing some pretty significant steps in that way more, you know, over the last year or two or three maybe, but you know, much more recently. One space I do a lot of work in is at the border. So we've got people from immigration here. Uh, but immigration, customs, the intelligence agencies, the, the law enforcement agencies, we're really seeing um, some quite significant uh, innovation, cooperation, change in the way we're thinking about the border and managing the border. And it's not just national cooperation, it's international cooperation that's occurring. Now, a lot of that is driven by constraint. It's no longer affordable for each agency to collect its own data, each agency to analyse its own data, each agency to act on its own data. It's now really important uh, in a time of resource constraint for agencies to look at what is my, you know, what is my particular value add um, and what role should I therefore be playing at the border and how can I leverage others who are better equipped to do that other piece. So we're seeing much more stitched up uh, information, stitched up activity, stitched up action at the border and a lot of that is driven by constraint, but it's actually a better outcome for the people of Australia uh, because more information is being pulled together. So it's not just at the border, we see it in the law enforcement world, we see it in the regulatory world, 
Right across government, we're seeing innovations by agencies working more closely together, which is partly driven by constraint. Um, so constraints are really, um, yeah, if, if I think of any sort of design activity, there's virtually no design activities that are not without constraints. If we had to design this chair, whoever designed it, um, there were constraints in terms of speed to market, um, weight, durability, cost to produce, aesthetic. There were a whole range of constraints that that chair had to, had to conform with. And so another, you know, another concern that I am sometimes given by people in government is, well, you know, it's all right for industry, they don't have to worry about constraints when they're designing, but we have to worry about constraints when we're in government. Well, apart from not being true, um, that statement really, you know, there are constraints in any design activity and constraints actually often improve the quality of the design. So new perspectives can come from customers and constraints. Where do transformational ideas come from? So the hypothesis in this talk is that they often come in that space between order and chaos, or if we stick with the Greek words, between cosmos and chaos. And that term is uh, often referred to as the edge of chaos. So another HBR article called Putting Your Company's Whole Brain to Work, there was a concept uh, coined somewhere in the 90s, a concept called creative abrasion. And it, it comes through in this article and it came through in that concept of creative abrasion that it's often when uh, two or three or four disciplines come together from different perspectives that you get a new idea. And I'll be giving, I'll be running through a bit of a case study later that probably illustrates this a little bit. But um, if you bring, for example, a, ge a geologist together with a neurosurgeon, the knowledge from the theory of how the brain works and the knowledge from the theory of how rocks work um, might give you a new insight. I have no idea what it would be. But we will give you, we will give you a bit. I will give you a bit of an example um, a bit later. This is not just um, theory. So, and you'll often see it uh, if a person comes into a field in a workplace um, and brings a new concept uh, to another context. Probably something I have seen over recent years, or you know, quite a few years now. Um, just for, well, let's go to the, John talked a lot, quite a bit about risk management. Now, risk management, if you talked about that in the mid-90s, that was a relatively new concept into government. Came out of the insurance world, and they, you know, insurance companies, if they're not good at risk management, they're not insurance companies for very long because they have to be able to calculate the probability of things happening um, to calculate premiums. And if they can't do that well, they really, that's, that's in many ways their core, their core capability is the ability to calculate risk and therefore construct premiums accordingly. I remember having a conversation as a sort of probably a mid-level public servant with somebody who was saying, He'd just been to a risk management conference and he's telling me about this concept which was somewhat controversial. And he said every industry um, exercises, has to exercise some sort of risk management. And we're saying, well, what about, you know, what about airlines? And he's saying, no, airlines have to exercise some degree of risk management. There's a, there's a degree to which they can't build in any more Commercially, they can't build in any more safety controls, security controls, uh, because there's always more they can do. But they have to draw the line. You know, for example, they could employ someone to check the work of somebody else's work who'd already been checked. You know, so you could just keep going through that process. 
But he said, no, you've got to, um, you know, even airlines, we fly in airlines every day, but even airlines have to ex express that. Now, in the mid-1990s, that was a fairly controversial concept. But over recent years, that creative abrasion of bringing an insurance concept into government has significantly changed um, a lot of what government does, and particularly, say, in the regulatory space where that whole concept of the regulatory pyramid and looking at what's the risk posed by an individual or an entity and we're going to take a differentiated response based on risk. That all, sound, that all rattles off the tongue well today and we all know about that if we're in a regulatory space. But if we were around in the mid-90s, some of that was quite controversial thinking. And that abrasion of an idea has really transformed the way that governments um, regulate. Now, one of the problems with order is that sometimes our order can be in the wrong, um, in the wrong order. As this set of cards, this is again something I borrowed. This is a pretty impressive assignment from a fellow called James Croft, who was at Ballarat University or TAFE or some tertiary institution in Ballarat. This is his assignment. So on the left-hand side, we have a series of cards arranged in perfect order, but you actually have to arrange them in non-perfect order to get the message, which is reject the expected order and challenge the cycle of monotonous repetition. I thought that was pretty clever. Um, and again, it illustrates this point that you know, we might have a highly ordered world, but it's perhaps not ordered uh, to be the optimum state. So to innovate in an ordered system, disrupt it. In, to innovate in a chaotic system, stabilise it. So disruption and stabilising, there's a time for them. What we can tend to do is find an ordered system and something happens and so we just apply more order to it. I'm going, yeah, I was actually going to go to another point then, but I just snuck a few slides in this morning, which, um, yeah, so I'll come back to that point shortly. There's just a couple of concepts, four concepts here. So we've already been through this one. Systems can currently display a mix of order and chaos. The other thing about um, the sorts of systems that you work in there are these attractors at play and um, they give patterns to the order. Now this is a famous um, attractor, a Lorenz attractor, very common in meteorology. But the metaphor is, it's a bit like this forum here today. We've got a group here today that are all interested in innovation and there's quite a few faces that I recognise in the group. There's an attractor here today around innovation in the public sector. And so we've got a range of people here. And so rather than um, Prime Minister and Cabinet or Department of Finance issuing an order that you will now innovate, uh, this is a more natural way of working with people who are interested and building the innovation capability uh, of the public sector by looking for the attractor in the system. So often when you're innovating, um, looking for those attractors out there and working with them rather than against them brings more innovation. Another thing about when you're looking at complex systems is um, this notion of self-similarity. Now often uh, many of you would have seen uh, images of Mandelbrot, Mandelbrot fract uh, fractals. This one is another example of a fractal, and it's a triangle pattern that is infinite. It just keeps going, and the more you zoom into that set of triangles, the more you will keep seeing them. And I tend to think often, you know, if I go into an organisation, I find there's just as much complexity if I'm working with a section or a team 
as if I'm working at the whole organisation level. So you can look at a whole department or you can look at multiple departments stitched together or you can look at a section within one department. The complexity, there's a self-similarity of complexity and issues at all levels. I'm going to flick over that one. So what works against operating at the end, edge of chaos? This is some work by uh, Boston Consulting Group, which is, um, I think, very interesting. They've got some indexes they've worked on, a complexity index, in other words, the external complexity that organisations are operating in today between 1955 and 2010 the complexity for organisations has been increased by a factor of six. Don't ask me how the formula was calculated, but um, it's increased by a factor of six. At the same time, organisations within themselves have increased complicatedness, which is things like procedures and processes and policies, by a factor of 35. So organisations' response to a little bit of disorder in the complexity index is let's overlay more and more procedure and policy to try and stabilise the system. And the systems, the organisations, of Boston Consulting Group's point here is they're buckling under the pressure of all this procedure and process and it's killing innovation and killing the people trying to work in those organisations. Now, I'm going to just go through uh, no tolerance for failure works against innovation. So we heard this uh, point again from John about you've got to be prepared to make mistakes. Mistakes aren't mistakes. Mistakes are just ways of learning how not to do something. And so this is an example of uh, a toaster that was developed, a new type of toaster, and how they made it out of cardboard then they added some wires, starting from the pictures, and ended up with the product on the right-hand side. That sort of prototyping mentality and learning from our mistakes, um, a critical element of innovation and being prepared uh, to try things and maybe even reframing it not as failure but as learning how not to do something. So finally, we'll just finish with an example. Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, a company, started in 1902. Uh, it thought it was producing a rock, mining a rock called corundum, which is uh, something you can use in sandpaper. Turned out that the rock that they thought they were mining was called anorthite, anorthosite, which is um, a worthless mineral. So they were unable to make sandpaper. They imported um, some stones from Spain called garnet. But unfortunately, the garnet stones, when they came across from Spain uh, to the United States, were packed next to olive oil. And when you try and glue garnet stones onto sandpaper that, and the garnet soaked in olive oil, it doesn't really hang on. Um, so they had this massive amount of inventory and so what they had to do was bake the garnet to try and dry the oil off so they could make sandpaper, which was an instance, the first instance in that company of research and development. Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, and actually the acronym for that company is 3M. And if you read a bit of their story, it's just been a bit of a litany of mistakes. It, it sounded like... Um, it sounded like, in, in something I read, they didn't turn a profit for about 10 or 12 years, which is a pretty brave company. I've been running a company for 10 years. I'd be a bit worried if I hadn't turned a profit for 10 years. Um, the post-it note, you probably all know the story, but the glue was invented um, as an accident. <laughs> Look at that. Post-it glue just came <laughs> off the wall as I spoke. Um, and it wasn't until six years after that post-it glue was invented that anybody realised anything useful could come with it. And it was a guy who apparently had in a church hymn book 
um, all his bits of paper were falling out and he was looking for a way of um, keeping the paper in place. And he thought, oh, what about that glue I made six years ago? So 3M and innovation, if you go to their website, it's pretty impressive. And um, this one down the bottom here, I'm just going to talk very quickly about, but it's about uh, this creative, creative um, abrasion concept where dentists at 3M and vehicle repair garage workers, they came together and the sorts of materials that dentists use to plug teeth, um, they started using to plug dents in cars. And so there was a cross uh, collaboration that invented a new product. So that pretty well takes me to where I was gonna go. How's my time? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I think this is about within 30 seconds of the projected finish time. I didn't rehearse those slides and I thought I had, uh, I didn't know if I had too much or too little content, but that's good, it worked. Thanks. Thank you, John.